All right. Now we get to move forward with this development of the Lorenz transformation in gauges, uh, sometimes known as the Lorenz conditions. Uh, it seems to be that the jargon with the paperwork and research seems to be a little inconsistent, at least in my brief stint of looking at it in grad school, my own, just own curiosity research. Um, there was a paper published out of uh, the uh, Princeton. It's on their uh, paper search site, uh, AR. I actually forget the, how to say it, but they uh, actually looked at the name of this condition. If you notice, this has a Z at the end instead of a TZ. And uh, up until recently, um, I think as early as 2001. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do a look at the uh, notes I took on it. But they often called this the Lorentz uh, gauge and transformation out of the uh, duct in honor of the Dutch physicist, uh, A-H-A, or excuse me, H-A Lorenz, uh, but that is not accurate. This is actually um, attributed to L-V Lorenz out of Dane, the Danish physicist. Uh, again, I'll put that in the notes, but uh, these names are not always uh, interchangeable as we might expect, but uh, definitely a nice little tidbit to have. Uh, with that, we have a quick question on this because we have two uh, famous or at least well-known gauges to deal with in the electromagnetic world, and uh, this problem highlights them. So, which of the potentials in example 10.1, problem 10.3, and problem 10.4 are a Coulomb gauge, and which are the Lorentz gauge? Notice that these gauges are not mutually exclusive. That is a very good point made by the author, and uh, a lot of things we deal with have a tendency to be mutually exclusive, this is not. So what we know is that the Coulomb gauge condition and Lorentz gauge, gauge conditions are given as such, where divergence of A equals zero, and the divergence of A gives us uh, a negative mu naught epsilon naught dv dt. Uh, there's pros and cons to both, but we'll go ahead and move uh, through and see which ones we have. So from example 10.1, we saw that the divergence was uh, zero and the time derivative of the scalar was zero because if you recall, we had a zero. Um, we were just given that the scalar potential was zero and we were given that the vector potential was a piecewise function. So if we take the derivative, that could zero. So this satisfies uh, both of the gauge conditions actually. We get the divergence of zero and that the divergence is equal to the negative time derivative of V which is zero, so zero equals zero. And these are both Coulomb and Lorentz gauge conditions. All right, that works. And problem 10.3, uh, we were given the potentials. So uh, divergence of A is equal to negative QT over four pi epsilon naught, divergence of R hat over R squared, which if you recall from chapter one, gave us the three dimensional Dirac delta. And so we're left with negative QT over epsilon uh, Dirac three, are, uh, but also since we were given that uh, the um, time derivative of v, which was zero in this case, uh, so time derivative of zero gives us zero, and we see that the divergence is not equal to zero, so this is neither Coulomb nor Lorenz. Lorenz would require an equivalent statement, and Coulomb would require the divergence to be zero, so neither. Now, problem 10.4, what we just saw, um, we saw that again, V was zero, so we know the time derivative equals zero, but we also know that we were given a um, sinusoidal in the y direction, but it's a function of x, so the divergence leads to zero. So we have a zero and a zero on both sides. So again, this is both Coulomb and Lorenz, and we are good to go. Easy enough?